and plowed into a crowd in a popular tourist spot in Barcelona. And then hours later, a similar attack in a seaside resort town. This is Outnumbered. I'm Sandra Smith, and here today, Harris Faulkner, the host of Kennedy on Fox Business, Kennedy, commentator and Fox News contributor Rachel Campos Duffy is here, and today's hashtag one lucky guy, a couch first timer, Blaze TV contributor and host of the Lawrence Jones show, Lawrence Jones himself, and he is outnumbered, and we Thanks welcome you, sir. Yay! Hey, you. you and I have been going back and forth on Twitter yeah, for a, a Texas, minute. So, uh, Texas takeover today. Yeah, we have so many people down in Texas together. Yeah. Uh, good to see you. Thanks well, for having me. Great to have you. I appreciate it's it. a big day. A massive manhunt is going on in Spain after back-to-back -back terror attacks. ISIS claiming responsibility for the attacks that killed 14 people and injured more than 100. Police are searching for an unknown number of suspects, including the driver of the van that plowed into a crowd in Barcelona. It's believed whoever did it ran off leaving the rental behind. Hours later, a car crashed into a crowd in the seaside, seaside resort town of Cambrils. Four people arrested so far, and five suspects wearing fake suicide belts in the second attack shot dead. President Trump tweeting his support for Spain, and Vice President Mike Pence saying this during a news conference in Panama City. The people of Barcelona should know our prayers and the prayers of all of the American people with the victims, their families, and all the good people of Spain. The United States of America, together with our allies, will find and punish those responsible and drive the evil of radical Islamic terror from the face of the earth. Connor Powell is live in Barcelona with the latest. Connor? Hi, Sandra. Well, uh, here on the promenade in Los Ramblas, it is beginning to spring back to life. We are seeing lots of people, uh, uh, tourists and Spaniards here, visiting this area. There are uh, makeshift memorials all up and down this promenade. There was a large rally earlier today with a moment of silence. Now, as all this is going on and people are paying their respects to those who were injured and killed, uh, there is a massive manhunt underway uh, for what police say was the driver of the vehicle, uh, 18-year-old Musa. So Okabir is believed to have been the one who drove his white van down the promenade here, striking and hitting people along the way. More than 100 people were injured and at least 13 people were killed. Police say he fled that van after it crashed and he is still wanted. But they are telling us more about the sort of network of cell of people who are involved in these two twin attacks, one here in Barcelona and the other one just south in Cambrils. Uh, there were at least five people who carried out this attack down south. Uh, they were all shot and killed and they have arrested four people. So right now there are a total of 10 people believed to be part of this cell. There are reports that the police here are also looking for others. That's not confirmed yet, but they are at least saying they're looking for this one Musa uh, Okabir. Now we're also learning more about some of those who were injured and killed. According to the State Department, we're finding out now that there was at least one American. We have now received word and confirmed the death of one American citizen in the terrorist attacks in Spain uh, amongst those who have been killed. Uh, we're still confirming the injuries and deaths of others, uh, but obviously we express our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of this individual and obviously the l others who have, been, uh, who have suffered loss of life, and we offer our thoughts and prayers. And just to give you a sense of what a popular tourist destination this is, obviously there was an American that was killed, there were a Brits who have been injured, and a, somebody from China, Pakistan, Venezuela, Hungary. I mean, it is a gigantic list of countries that have people that were affected here. Uh, police right now are saying that the priority is to try to find the driver. Uh, but as we've seen throughout the day today, Sandra, the list of people, uh, the, the cell network continues to get larger, so it's very possible that there will be other names added to that list of people they're trying to find. This was a big, well organized attack, not only here in Barcelona, but also in that little seaside village. There was a, a third incident that security officials here would say was related. Somebody uh, detonated a bomb uh, in a, just a village not too far from here as well. So this was a big, well-planned attack, Sandra. All right, Connor Powell, thank you for that update there. We want to now go, go on the ground in Maryland, where Air Force One has touched down. President Trump has arrived to Hagerstown Regional Airport. Um, the president will be departing the airport there in Maryland en route to Camp David. Uh, 
short time from now, 12.05 p.m., Air Force One touchdown. You're looking live at President Trump on the ground there en route to Camp David. Uh, we'll keep following his movement. Meanwhile, President Trump weighing in on our sec uh, security back here at home. He says the Department of Homeland Security and law enforcement are on alert in the wake of the Spain attacks. He then accused Democrats and the courts of making us less safe an apparent reference to the battle over his travel pan ban. The president tweeting, quote, the obstructionist Democrats make security for our country very difficult. They use the courts and associated delay at all times. Must stop. He then added this, radical Islamic terrorism must be stopped by whatever means necessary. The courts must give us back our protective rights. Have to be tough. Lawrence Jones is here with us. Lawrence, what a day. Yeah. What do you make of all of it? Well, uh, I'm, I'm concerned when it comes to uh, profiling because a lot of people want to talk about racial profiling, but that's not a criminal profile. Uh, your race, uh, your religion can be in the criminal profile, and we do have to take the handcuff off of law enforcement so they can start getting these people. Um, we hear so many times, watch list, watch list. Well, then they commit a terror attack. Okay, so obviously you guys aren't watching them hard enough, or the court system is delaying things, or Democrats are obstructing uh, uh, these warrants that they want to serve. So we got to get that under control. Um, it's the same language that we're hearing overseas right now where they said that there was intelligence. Uh, it seems like they didn't follow up on the intelligence, and that's a problem. Um, Kennedy, it's a tough day, really, for everybody uh, to take this all in. No, it, it really isn't, and considering all that's going on in the world. You know, we're, we're looking at a hotbed in North Korea uh, with a personality there who uh, it, it's so hard to really get a grasp on where someone like Kim Jong-un is coming from and, and the security risk he might pose to the United States. You look at what's going on domestically, politically, and the trouble the president is having, and now we look to Spain, and the first thing you think is, you know, my God, how do we keep these things from happening? happening here. And I think Lawrence is right. We have to be very careful that our first instinct isn't to grab onto more power and squash more people's civil liberties because, as Lawrence pointed out, uh, oftentimes when we do that, we miss the people we should be targeting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we miss the bad guys, whether it's here or abroad. And when we, we cast too big of an intelligence net, that's always the worry. And we have to take all of these unfortunate examples and refine law enforcement and intelligence gathering so we do go after the right people and don't let them go which happens in so many cases. And Rachel, you always come to us fresh from the Midwest <laughs> um, in the Wisconsin area where you are in touch with the people there. And people are scared. I mean, you, you, you saw it play out in the stock market yesterday. You saw that nearly 300-point plunge in the Dow. Yeah. Uh, you talk to your neighbors, your friends, people wondering, what can we do here? What more can we do to prevent attack, an attack like that from happening here? Absolutely. People are scared and worried, and they want the president to protect us, and they voted for him to protect us. Um, and I think... He was largely elected because of that. I also come to you with the perspective from Spain. My mom's from Spain. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Spain for, you know, I lived there for five years. I have a lot of relatives there. Um, last week, we talked about the travel ban. I think the president was also referring to the infrastructure bill that he wants to include a border wall and secure us um, from, that, from that perspective as well. Last week in Spain, I think it's a week or two ago, um, a boatload of, of people from North Africa, Muslims from North Africa, just showed up on a beach. Um, they, they made their way over to the, to the shores of Spain and just got off the beach, and the police couldn't even capture all of them. Um, so they're having their own border um, problems there. And Catalonia happens to be the region of Spain with the highest number of, of Muslim immigrants, and partly because um, so many of the secessionists um, within that government um, and that political party want to bring those people in in order to yeah. have more votes for their political cause. So I, I like to look for similarities like what sure. you're talking about and we both have lived in the upper Midwest. I was yes. in Minnesota and have covered so much uh, of their challenge and struggle in terms of letting people in from the Somali Muslim community yes. and, and much of it has been successful but we know just last June there were quite a few young Somali Muslim men who were found guilty of trying to join ISIS in Minneapolis and suburbs there. So what's similar? Well Catatonia as I understand it is very similar similar situation where they've invited people in yeah. and assimilation has been a challenge for those people for whatever reason yeah. um, but the bottom line is the next step in all this is how do you then work with those communities I think how, how do you go back because the young man that they're looking for now 
the terrorist is 18. Mm. Right. Yeah. And if he even started a year or so ago, he wasn't even legally an adult yet. That means his web is family and friends. Think about most teenagers you know. They're, they're worldly in their minds, but their pocketbooks aren't. I, so my point in saying this is we are facing this challenge in this country already. And, and Wisconsin knows this as well as Minnesota. We have to do something to make sure that we're reaching out to those communities because I don't know how you're going to do it without them. And I think you're right that it starts with young people and it starts with a country that isn't afraid to say the word assimilation. In Spain, it is much more controversial, the idea of assimilation. We're all better at it than they are, we and we need to get even means. better. It doesn't Lawrence mean Bucky. that they feel so comfortable that the whole planet becomes a sanctuary city. Uh, That's not what we're talking about. But, but I think the problem, I think we're looking at this from a different perspective. Yeah, the ideology is a problem. we got to crush the ideology. But we know who these people are. Yeah. They've been on watch lists. We've been watching it. And the question is, why aren't we capturing these people before they commit the act? In Garland, Texas, uh, at the Special Event Center, we saw the terror uh, attack happen there. Why did the undercover FBI agent not fool this? I mean, Garland is pushing out the local police department. Yeah, why, why, why are we he, stopping why was them? He why was he just watching? To their credit, the robot did take some stuff out. He did. He did. And, and the officer did it as well. But an undercover officer was there and he stood there. Why? Steve Hilton made the same point sitting where you were, where you are yesterday, saying almost every time we find out they were known to authorities. But Buck Sexton on this program yesterday, former CIA and NYPD. PD, these low tech style attacks, almost impossible for them to prevent. Well, and but particularly and the, the vehicle attacks. I mean, that's that's what's so confounding about them, and that's why Al Qaeda and ISIS have been encouraging uh, their supporters and, and followers to use vehicles because anyone can get one. You get a lot of attention, and you can do a lot of damage uh, pretty easily. Unfortunately, but, but Sandra and San Bernardino. It was political correctness that didn't foil that. It wasn't about the cops. It was about a neighbor afraid to see, say what she saw. All right, we've got to leave it there. We are awaiting an announcement from the mayor of Charlottesville about the city's Robert E. Lee statue that sparked so much controversy. What we can expect to hear from him. Plus, in the aftermath of that violence, President Trump planning another campaign-style rally in Phoenix. But the mayor there says the nation needs time to heal. Is he right, or could that be the president's chance to unite the country? Alert. We are awaiting a statement from Charlottesville's mayor. He's expected to make a major announcement regarding the city statue of General Robert E. Lee. Local media there reporting the mayor wants to change his statue vote to remove. All this as Confederate-linked monuments across the nation are being taken down in the wake of last week's violence in Charlottesville. Well, some of them taken down in different ways other than going through the actual process, I will say. The latest a statue at the Maryland State House commemorating the Supreme Court Justice who wrote the Dred Scott decision that upheld slavery. Also, Nancy Pelosi of the House is joining other Democrats in calling for the removal of Confederate statues in the halls of Congress. Democratic Senator Cory Booker said he plans to introduce a bill to do just that. But House Speaker Paul Ryan says any decision to remove the statue should be up to the individual states sponsoring them. All of this, as President Trump tweeted, that removing the monuments is ripping apart our nation's history and culture. Where are you on this, Lawrence? Well, you know, the statues, I get it. People are upset about it. And I'm not saying that I like the statues. But at the end of the day, removing the statue is not going to make lives better for black folks. I'm just sorry. It's not. Economic prosperity is going to make the lives better. And I, and I get the debate. Um, I think local cities should decide. States should decide. But I think this is becoming a distraction on what really matters for the black community, my community. And I think we should be more focusing on uh, economic prosperity, uh, education getting those reforms done because just because you remove the statue is not going to take hate out of certain racist hearts i'm sorry rachel you know it's a really tough issue and i'm not from the south so i don't understand a lot of the cultural things that come from there i do think that removing them via a mob um doesn't seem to uh advance the cause which is unifying people around our American values I think this whole conversation about statues is premature I think what's happening in our culture it needs to start with our kids we need to talk more about what we unify around which is our values our mm. principles the Constitution the flag patriotism we need a lot more conversation about that and a lot less about this and diversity and all the things that actually separate us and I think if we started from there these conversations would be easier to have so, if you'll just allow me, I want to come back to you, Lawrence, because you know in the black community,
community that there is uh, this feeling that there might be pain around these statues there is. people. I, I'm from the South. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Georgia. I was mm -hmm. born on a military base down there. Um, so I've heard the conversations about that. But what you're talking about also just isn't economic reform. It demands that people who look like you and me then do the things to pull ourselves up to make that equality about economics and opportunity and dream making. Most definitely. And, and, and I totally agree. And I understand the pain as well. I don't want to see Confederate flags. I know everyone that carries a Confederate flag is not hateful. But I don't want to see it. But at the end of the day... Because of the symbolism and the pain that, the, that surrounds when, it. When I saw him in front of schools, that tells me you're not welcome there. Not for everybody, but for me, that's what it makes me feel like. But at the end of the day, it revolves around money. What is best well, for black and opportunity? And Because, you know, when you look at the numbers, economic prosperity and all that, it's not going so well. And I don't want uh, people of color to get so distracted on the statue and not the issues directly affecting our so community. So can I add to that? There was an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal this morning that was really interesting and kind of goes along those lines. These statues are meant to unite us, Rachel, to your point, but also to educate us. And Richmond's mayor has a solution. He's saying leave the statues, but provi provide context to them. He says uh, he believes the rebel luminaries have uh, important truths. He says he's advocating for adding context signage to the monuments, which will set the historical record straight. I wanted to run that idea past you. I, I, don't, I don't think people care if it's uh, telling us what the historical uh, uh, relationship it is. At the end of the day, uh, sometimes I think when, pe when, when you remove history, it, you set yourself up to repeat it. And I think sometimes these statues can serve as a reminder, don't go back there. Don't forget it. I, I want to pull up a quick poll, well if we can, asking our team to do this. Because, you know, you might ask yourself, Kennedy, well, why would the mayor then begin to change his view on things? And maybe it's because of some of the response from the community. Maybe his, you know, he's had a heart change. Who knows? Um, um, but the historic symbol, 62% say remove it because it's offensive. Uh, some, 27% say, uh, excuse me, it's the other keep way it. Yeah. Yes, I got it flipped. 62% say re keep it there, the historic value, so on and so forth. 27 say remove it. Yeah, I, I think actually, I mean, the fact that we're having a conversation about right. history, I think is a wonderful thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Because erasing your history means you can't learn the important lessons from it. And, and we have a very painful past in this country. Yeah. And I think if we try and pretend like it didn't happen for one reason or another, and maybe that's convenient for both sides for different reasons, I think that's doing an incredible disservice. Because I actually think that our, our country is strong enough to have a discussion mm -hmm. uh, about these painful lessons and maybe you do provide context. I actually think what, what Sandra was saying is very important and maybe we do learn more and we do delve into it apolitically if that's possible at this point and, and learn where we've been so we can actually see where we're going and not repeat those same mistakes. Exactly. Yeah. Right All right, we'll move on. President Trump is planning to go to Phoenix next week to hold a campaign style rally like the one he just had two weeks ago in West Virginia but Phoenix's Democratic mayor is slamming the president saying he should not hold that rally that the nation needs time to heal from the charlottesville violence who is right on this what should the president do also reaction is pouring in over how these two magazine covers are depicting our president whether the mainstream media are taking their criticism of the president way too far Welcome back to Outnumbered. President Trump planning another campaign-style rally next week in Arizona. It isn't clear yet uh, what the president will say in Phoenix. Do we ever know in advance? But that city's mayor is not happy about his trip on the heels of the Charlottesville violence. Democrat Greg Stanton saying, quote, I am disappointed that President Trump has chosen to hold a campaign rally as our nation is still healing from the tragic events in Charlottesville. It is my hope that more sound judgment prevails and that he delays his visit. Now, meantime, former President Clinton, his pollster, her pollster rather, there's so many Clintons, Doug Schoen <laughs> says that it was man President Clinton's pollster, says it's time for the president <laughs> to speak to the nation and try to unite people. Oh. He writes, quote, what the president needs to do now is deliver an Oval Office address that seeks to set the record straight about where we are headed, mm. an address that goes well beyond the tragedy that happened in Charlottesville and outlines our national goals, aspirations, and values. The president needs to speak to one nation under God in a way that he has yet to do. Uh, there is a lot to discuss here, Lawrence. I'm going to start with the Phoenix rally. Obviously, these rallies are very good for the president mm -hmm. and that it sets it, it is a reset button for him politically and perceptually. Uh, he 
is able to discuss the things that he wants to discuss in the way he wants to discuss them, which is around a, a group of people who are still very excited about his agenda. Is this mayor in Phoenix being purely political, or is there a, does he have a point? Should the president delay this rally? No rallies. No rallies. Go to your people. Go to communities across the country. He likes being on the road. This is an opportunity. Go to communities of color and talk about the issues that are facing them. And then have some humility. Say, I didn't understand uh, why this was wrong to you, that I broke your heart. Mm. I didn't understand that. But you know what? I'm going to do better. And I'm going to fix the economic status in your community. I'm going to help fix the education system. At the end of the day, this was an emotional week for all of us. Yeah. And it's understandable. But at the end of the day, once our emotions die down, we have real issues. Yeah. And this is the opportunity for the president to go on the road and talk to the voters. Not this rally stuff with the people that are already supporting you. Mm. Go find the people uh, that want to support you and that are hurt and, and need economic prosperity. Yeah. That's what he should do. I, I do understand why Phoenix, why Arizona for a couple of reasons he can talk about infrastructure which we know the president has wanted to do and he can talk about building the wall um, which is part of that he can talk about health care because we know that Obamacare has plummeted in its ability to give people sustainable health care uh, and those prices went so high in that particular state of Arizona um, for coverage so I get that the problem is when your message will be usurped by all of the recent history it doesn't serve you and mistakes get made when you try to overcome the obvious which is you need to have a different conversation yeah. right now. So there's some opportunities also. Your hometown of Chicago, where they had upwards of a dozen murders over the last few weekends. Um, and the president talked yeah. about this when he was a candidate, yeah. how best to change the economic situation in Illinois for people of color and those urban communities. He didn't get a lot of credit because he probably lumped all of us into urban right. communities yeah, he at talked the time. About it. But he talked about it and he got the conversation to go there. So if you want to look for opportunities, it doesn't always have to be about the baseline of where we are. Yeah. He could mix it up in what you're saying along with economic prosperity. He could go to a place where our former president is from, President Obama, and struggled. Yeah. Seemed, it seemed to be to, to actually get there to, mm -hmm. to deal with the murder right there. Yeah. Uh, just a thought. Um, you know, my family lives in Arizona. Um, some of them are Trump Mine supporters. too? Yep, some of them aren't. Um, I don't think he should go do a rally there either. Um, look, I think the Democrat mayor... Did, did you say that because you're worried about some of the counter-protests and I, that it I'm, could turn violent or the president just needs to focus and reset in a different way? I think it's both. I think, first of all, the Democrat uh, mayor, his his reasons are probably more political uh, for why he doesn't want uh, uh, the uh, president to go. I think for the poli for the for the president, it's politically more advantageous for him at this moment to be more presidential. And I think Doug yeah. Schoen is doing a huge favor to the president right now because he is giving excellent advice. He should act presidential and he should give this address. I like your idea. I, don't, I think maybe things are too raw to go into those communities right now, and I think there'll be a lot of counter protests, and they have to deal with that. He should You'll be something. surprised. May, maybe, you, maybe, you think I, maybe find a receptive audience. Oh, I think definitely. he should be in the Oval People Office. Are crying. I go to my my barbershop in Garland, Texas, every single week, yeah. and they support the president. Mm. They want help, yeah. but they need the president to speak to them. I heard the president message during the campaign. Now it's time for the president after, to show humility and go to them. All right, not after the Oval Office. In. I think he should do the Oval Office and maybe then go out, but I think well, you're right. We'll, we'll see the, the media certainly is. Is the barbershop uh, watching today, by the way? They should be proud right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're all proud of Lawrence. He's doing a great job first time on the couch. In the meantime, two prominent news magazines sparking outrage with their latest covers uh, following President Trump's controversial remarks about the deadly violence in Charlottesville. The cover of The New Yorker, titled Blowhard, depicts President Trump Ugh. in a boat with, uh, that's, that's The Economist, uh, there we go, a boat with sails that resemble the hood of a Ku Klux Klansman. And the cover of The Economist, that's the other magazine, it shows the president using very similar imagery, a KKK hood, as a megaphone. Now, obviously, Lawrence, uh, they're trying to say as much as they possibly can yeah. uh, with pictures uh, that are very descriptive, yet minimalistic. See, this is why the president starts to push back. This is why he goes to his corner. Yeah. Because the moment all of this happened, people start saying he's the racist and that he's a part of the Klan. And this is why he started to resist. But I would encourage the president, don't pay attention to this. These are the same people that hated you from the very beginning. Mm. So don't react to Focus, it? Don't react. Please don't. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do as please take some suggestions and go to your communities and talk to them. All right. Well, Sandra Print is dying, and magazine covers are getting more and more aggressive. Apparently, just, it didn't die with that. Just, just yeah. trying to get uh, some attention and sell some. Uh, this, I think this just goes back to how difficult of a day and a week this is because. Yeah. 
That's that's that's, that's the highest office in the land that they're talking see, about right but there. But Sandra, those covers I think actually draw a lot of people to Trump because people are so, so. I, no, those covers are so. Can we put them back up so they're people so are tuning in? They know what we're talking and about. They're, they're, they're so incendiary Please. and they're so wrong. The president is not a racist. He may have handled this not as great as he should have. There's plenty of room for him to have learned from that, and I, yeah. I wish he had the humility right. to acknowledge that. That said, he's not a racist, and regular Americans, non minority Americans are sick and tired of, they, they don't want to talk about race, not because they don't want to talk about race, because if you even dip your foot in it, you will get I'm called racist. a racist. Look at what happened on the couch with Melissa the, uh, Francis the other day. People have been tweeting her and saying very mean things about what happened. A moment that I thought was very raw, very honest, hardly racist, but that's what happens. And so I think it actually makes people more sympathetic in white you, America you to the president on, when that happens. You touch on the rawness, and, and, and you, you, you said you would you disagree about the president going to the community because it's so raw. Yeah. It's the rawness when the president is at his best because it connects with the hearts of Americans. You can't put the president in front of an oval office setting and speak to the camera because it won't be genuine. It won't, it won't so connect. You're talking to the guys in your barbershop, I'm down with that. But what's going to happen is if he does that, it's all the Antifa and other people that yeah, will come Yeah, but those people are going to show up matter. anyway. They're, they're outside the White House right now. They were outside Trump's that's true. tower. They're, yeah, well, that's, I don't that's know what if they're there right this second. But, but they've been everywhere he goes. I, I want to acknowledge something, Kennedy, just really quickly. Because when you hear black people say this, there are some who will say, well, you're just Pollyanna, you're, you're not realistic. What you're saying is you think, as a black person, there is room for this president still to come forth. Almost and there are some in our community who don't feel like that at all. There is a teaching moment. Exactly. All and, okay. and it's, it's a moment of humility. The problem where these consultants and advisors you go wrong... You don't lose by talking. Is exactly. My exactly. But when you try to put the president in a state of being professional and this man in front of... Oh, it, it loses people. He has to be raw with the American people. And I think uh, black folks want to hear from him. They want to hear from him. And this is an opportunity to start dialogue. And it can be raw. And the president maybe can be brings, himself. Maybe he brings a group to the White House. Maybe That's a step. Do. I think he should bring you. <laughs> barbershop I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm serious. I well, and, I'll, and I'll serve my country for anyway. I can. may not know, I mean, the barbershop in the black community is where we go. It's the, the center. Parlor is where we go. Exactly. It's the center of that conversation. That is the heart. Tough and hard. It is. Right? In the Romanian community, we just go eat stuffed cabbage. <laughs> Can I come? Because I love cabbage. Absolutely. All right, I'm all over. The RNC slamming reports that former oh, President Kennedy. Obama will be returning to the political scene ahead of the 2018 midterm, saying Democrats have no one better to turn to. Is that the case? Or can President Obama fire up the base once again? Plus, Trump cabinet members pushing back on White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon's claim that there's no military solution with North Korea. Who's right? And how should we be dealing with the looming nuclear threat? So much to discuss right here. The Republican National Committee slamming reports that President Obama will return to the political scene just in time to help Democrats before the 2018 midterms. The RNC tweeting, the Democratic Party is so weak they keep turning back to the same old favorites. And he's not the only familiar face set to make an appearance. Hillary Clinton expected to return to the spotlight when her new book about the 2016 election is released next month. She also reportedly wants to play a role in next year's midterms. <clears throat> I guess I, I need to think about the way I phrase this question. <laughs> Would you welcome a, a Hillary Clinton entrance uh, into the... <laughs> Did she ever leave? <laughs> I don't think she ever left. She's like that relative right. on the back porch where the, you know they're still hanging out. Well, what, what time is dinner? I haven't right. left yet. But seriously, how would that how would that change things? Do you want to lose again? I mean, that's my first response: is Do you guys want to lose again? You're trying the same strategy over and over again. It seems like the, the, they're more concerned about uh, the current uh, the current political climate, and they're thinking that because uh, white people came back and they're upset. These are the same people that voted for Obama, that's and right. you need to go and and go talk to the forgotten people and. And they're not refocusing their strategy. So would, would, would former President Obama help things out for the Democrats? Uh, he's their best hope, but he can't run again. They're trying to find another Obama, and he's very charismatic, even if you disagree with his but, policy. What, what, but there won't be another but one if you're again. Trying Who would to that be, exactly? But Nobody. If, if you're trying to win back 
the Democrats and independents that you lost in the last election. Bringing back Obama is not going to do it. I don't care how popular he is. But His policies did nothing to lift the middle class, working class Americans up. But I, and, and so unless they're willing to change their position, which is so far to the left, this is a policy party p problem. Um, they have candidates within that party. Tim Ryan, um, the other one was uh, Dan Lipinski in Ohio, who happens to also be pro-life. Those people are being pushed down because yeah. in the Democrat Party, it's not a big tent like the but Republican it's also Party. It's also you have connecting to drink the or you're not allowed to ride. All right, but here's here's something else completely that we we have to consider, which I think is great because uh, as as an independent libertarian, I don't have a political party. Right. You know, I'm I'm not an affiliated voter, and so it's always fun to watch these horse races on both sides with two major parties. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm watching with the reentry of President Obama is how he takes on Bernie Sanders right. because Hillary Clinton tried, and you know she succeeded, but barely. The former president couldn't take Hillary over uh, over the line right. into the end zone. He couldn't do it. He couldn't seal the deal with his unique coalition and now it's going to be very interesting because there is a massive chasm in the Democratic Party and you've got progressives like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders on one side and whether you like it or not President Obama still represents the establishment. But if that's the case and that's really just how not deep their bench is there could always be a, a star that emerges later on. Yeah, well, he did. I mean, and Barack Obama did, right? Exactly. Um, but you know, there's that that disingenuous though thing between connection. him and Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Remember, she needed new car smell. <laughs> she need, she needed a lot of things. She's likable enough. <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of reasons down the stretch. Remember the big rally in mm -hmm. Philadelphia? Why why he couldn't help her? Because I think that there were some Democrats who looked at this and said, "Well, if you loved her so much, um, you quashed her, you squashed her so badly." Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the basis. Uh, what, more with what Bernie, don't you think? I mean, I think believe. the base is with Bernie, and Hillary only took on Bernie by cheating. Um, and so she had help. From she had a lot of help. Schultz at the DNC. That's right. And so I think what they have is a policy yeah. problem, and they don't want to face it. They don't want to move. Obama is very, very much um, is, is closer to Bernie than probably. But is Hillary. it policy or is it connecting? Because it's not like Trump oh, had the best. Both. It's not like Trump had Look, the they best were policy. For bumper sticker yeah. mottos. This, yeah. I'm not making that up. We did that as a segment here <laughs> yeah. on the show. Yeah. The Democratic Party. Was looking for its message. They, they can't sell themselves for the wider they public. Don't they don't, on a they don't have a tagline. That, they that, don't have ideas. That, that, yeah, that, that takes uh, whatever that the works. party stands for. Whatever it means to be a Democrat, they don't have a tagline to represent the that. They can't reach out to voters because they they have so yeah, many. Yeah, I'm with her. Didn't ideas work for right them. Now. That was about her. That wasn't yeah. about voters. Them. That wasn't about yeah. wasn't about America. And the I'm with America. They couldn't see that. So does it help to have one of the leaders of your party want to get back in, but also put out a book? that says what happened, which keeps the party looking back. Yeah. Yeah. What happened? Oh, and it hurt. How did it feel? Yeah, All right, guys, we got to get on this right now. New York Times is reporting Steve Bannon is out at the White House. This is just coming in according to a New York Times report. Obviously, this was heavily specula speculated on up yeah. to this moment. Steve Bannon out at the White House is according to the New York Times. Our sources wow. are on this as well right now. Lawrence Jones, I want to get your immediate reaction to well, that. Well, we saw this coming. They're I replacing mean, him with you, Lawrence. No, 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 no. I don't think that they would like <laughs> now, me. Now, let's, let's um, talk about this because um, this is a very th this big is, and, and serious th th This is a problem, and, and I think this also goes back to this week. Um, did the president cave to the pressure? Yeah. Because a lot of people are saying part well, of the reason why it went wrong this week with the messaging is because Steve Banning was advising him yeah. to not uh, disavow that part so of the, the supporters. exact reporting from the New York Times is that the president told senior aides that he has decided to remove Steve Bannon. Um, well, there, White there, House well, I mean, they knew they, from earlier today that the chief of staff, uh, John Kelly, John Kelly, was looking at you know whether or not this was going to be something that they would do. And I'm trying to find the exact reporting that we had on that. But but anyway, this was something that they were looking at, and you know we even saw, and I, I saw this written about a little while ago, a little blip on the screen of the Dow Jones on the stock market this morning as this discussion yeah. was being reported, uh, and whether and whether or not that was kind yeah, of yeah, the Dow has been in, in negative territory. Yeah. And now now it's moving Move in positive things territory. back into positive territory if they got rid of Steve Bannon. So that was a discussion that was being reported on. And if, in fact, this was in reaction to what's happened all week long, what mm -hmm. does that tell us, Kennedy? It tells us that the president's 
three reactions to Charlottesville, uh, Charlottesville show a rift within the White House. John Kelly came in. Uh, he's been a very decisive chief of staff. We've seen reports that not only Steve Bannon perhaps leaked some of the biggest stories out of the White House, but also that his relationship uh, with the president has grown very, very frosty. And the fact that he had the counter reaction that he did on Tuesday, uh, that further exposed the rift. And I said Monday on the show that Steve Bannon was not going to last through the week, that Charlottesville would be his death knell because so there, to be clear though the reporting says uh, that he had submitted his resignation to the president dating back to August 7th which per my calendar that would have been last Monday mm -hmm. about two weeks ago um, they were still having discussions as of this morning according to the report a person close to Mr. Bannon insisted the parting of the ways was his idea and that he had submitted his resignation last Monday. Do you think he was the leaker? Monday. Do you think that has something to do with well, it? Well I mean I don't think that's said that for us before to speculate he left. on yeah, any of that. What we can do is report the facts. President Trump told senior aides that he had decided to remove Bannon um, and, and that who helped Mr. Trump actually win the 2016 election. And this is according to two administration officials uh, inside that discussion telling the New York Times this. So there were people apparently in the room as this discussion was going on. That's an important fact too because one thing we do know is that we will find out probably in short order if there are a couple people who talked about this. Now remember when Anthony Scaramucci, the, right. the uh, minute-long communications director, yeah. <laughs> uh, came back onto the scene, he was very critical of Steve Bannon very publicly saying, you know, he felt that this that he should have been removed. And the back and forth that we now know that existed between yeah. Bannon and other people on the staff is coming out. But to your point, exactly. I, I, I think you've nailed it. And Anthony Scaramucci was removed when, you know, General John Kelly came in as, as chief of staff. He had what he thought, he claims he thought, was an off-the-record conversation uh, with a New Yorker reporter. And now Steve Bannon had a very similar, he claims he thought it was also an off-the-record conversation. Right. I'm reading uh, about that now. With the reporter with, with Robert that was Hutner. his parting gift. Yeah, exactly. But there, there were some incendiary things in there that when I saw that break, I, I thought to myself, well, He's this out. is absolutely it. General Kelly is going to look at this and, and say to himself, we cannot have these people who are in charge of messaging and policy in the White House talking to reporters in these terms in this way. And remember what uh, President Trump said standing at the first floor of Trump Tower just a couple days ago, refusing to guarantee Bannon's job security, but defended him saying his words, he's not a racist, and called him a friend. But he did end his comments by saying, we'll see what happens Look, with Mr. Bannon. He I don't also think said the, the same thing about James Comey. He said right. the same thing about Reince Priebus before. Go ahead, Lawrence. I, I don't think the president wanted uh, Bannon out of the White House uh, for Why political not? reasons, because you don't want Steve Bannon now uh, controlling a conservative media. I'm sorry. Well, and that's what I'm, you know, that's what I've been reading for a couple of weeks about this whole thing. It's like, so how do you handle this very prickly situation with Steve Bannon? Because he can hurt you if he goes and wide he and doesn't agree with you. But so how do you keep that? And are they as close as the president had said? And maybe that's something that you don't have to worry about. But you also about. might have some problems within the base. And the Trump coalition is 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 already, you know, a little bit weakened by what's happened. Some people have, have drawn closer to him. Other people were, um, you know, put off by what happened last week, but there are economic nationalists, not racial nationalists, economic nationalists who really felt good about Bannon being in, in the White House. And so I think President Trump is going to have to reassure that part of his base. I so, think but he also had some very curious things to say about North Korea. And, you know, when, when his uh, personal ideas That's on solving that crisis run completely contrary to your, depart your Department of Defense, uh, then, you know, you have to consider who you've got in your close inner circle. So you and are thinking it. the same thing right now, Kennedy. So what's happening simultaneously to this information? The president is at Camp David reportedly talking about what to do about North Korea yeah. and national security with regard to North Korea as we speak. And, and our ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, as well as the Secretary of State and uh, the Secretary of Defense have all said so military options are on the table. All options have to be on the table. And uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis's comments reflected what the President so what the American might people tell us is, what this might tell us just based on the facts of that meeting going on right now at Camp David, what we know Steve Bannon had said about North Korea and what's transpired right. this week is it's probably a confluence of things. It's probably, oh, most any, definitely, probably most a variety definitely. of reasons. I don't think what he said 
what? about North Korea was all that controversial. All he really said was, "Hey, look, it, no, but it, it lies in the hands of China." Some of the others who are who reportedly will be yeah, at the White House. We're not in the room right now. He's been working in the White House, and also I think he's run out of allies. Right, right. You know, and he was undermining the White House. It seems like Anthony Scaramucci said from the very beginning when he got in there that Bannon was one of the leakers. We can't repeat what he called him. We can't even. I just yeah. feel like it's very shady that the leak, the leaker, was next to the president the entire time, and it if seems it like it. Him. Does well, this help the president? How does this help the president? Well, I, I do. I, I think that it help, helps the president. I, I feel like it does. I think Bannon was a problem from the very beginning. It did help him in the beginning because uh, you know you got that part of the base to support the president as a result. But now I think it's time to part ways. Uh, but he will go after the president now that he's going to be back in control of his media. You seem so sure of that. Okay, but, but I have a question close. about that. And, and I don't know what the answer to this is. So people who advise the president, people who have these incredibly close roles, do they sign non-disclosure agreements? Is there something that you have to sign when you work for the president that says that you, you know, you will not take certain jobs. Well, the people president write books, so I mean, they, they must be, there must be some leeway there. Yeah. Um, this real quick. So from that interview that Steve Bannon said he thought was off the record, which is such a trend now. <laughs> you leave man. the White House you and still leave, like an off the record thing. He said, quote, ethno-nationalism, it's losers. It's a fringe element, Bannon said. I think the media placed it up too much and we got to help crush it, you know, uh, help crush it more. These guys are a collection of clowns. And of course, that's the one quote that has really been out there. Why do you think he says that in an interview, Rachel, right out the door? Listen, I think Steve Bannon could um, hurt him, like you said, mm -hmm. but I also think um, that they are probably close friends, and I don't think that he wants to. This is If Steve Bannon really wanted to see his economic nationalist agenda happen, mm. um, why would he hurt the person who can bring it about. So I just wanted to say to that we now out. have a confirmed Fox News. John Roberts, chief White House correspondent, confirmed per his source uh, that Steve Bannon is out at the White House. We're trying to source him on the White House front lawn uh, to get more on this because we'll remind everybody that we the last time we saw President Trump was early this hour uh, landing and heading to Camp David. So John Roberts is in studio right now. John Roberts, Steve Bannon out. What can you tell us? Yes, yeah, Sandra. I mean, this is something that's been rumored for an, an awfully long, 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 awfully long. Okay. So, all right. Wow. <laughs> That's a bit of a difficulty all right. there. Um, obviously, live television. We'll try to get him back, um, but he has confirmed this news. So I, I want to go back to this question, though, about what Steve Bannon was saying about the recent events, because yeah. it, it seemed to, I don't know what he normally would have said, but he's saying this in something he says was off the record. But he was also clearing his name. I don't know if you guys, because yeah. people were painting him as the racist in right. the White House. So now he's saying we must crush <laughs> yeah. this. We must right, right, right. This stronger language than the president was using at that time. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Uh, John Roberts, are you good now, sir? We'd love to hear what you have. I, I thought I was good before, Sandra. But you were excellent, yeah, John. Yeah. Um, so listen, you know, I mean, Steve Bannon is one of the people who was closest to the president ideologically, if not personally. The president has said that he came into the campaign late, uh, but that uh, he was clearly a force uh, during the campaign and a force there at the White House. But we are now told by two sources that Steve Bannon will be leaving the White House. Uh, I was communicating uh, with him this morning on some, some other issues. Uh, he uh, deferred when I asked him whether or not he was uh, coming or going, but uh, it looks like the president has decided uh, after a review that was conducted by his chief of staff, John Kelly, uh, to remove Steve Bannon from his position as his chief strategist. Uh, it's also likely, too, that this is just the first shoe to drop. I mean, there is, you know, it's no secret although the White House has really tr kind of tried to paper over it, but it's no secret that there have been a number of rivalries in the White House. Uh, there was uh, Steve Bannon, sometimes against Rice, Reince Priebus, sometimes allied with Reince Priebus against some of the other factions in the White House, including Jared Kushner and Gary Cohen. So uh, I, I don't know for sure, Sandra, but I would think that uh, this is not the last departure that we're going to hear of uh, from this White House. Now, a lot of people, by the way, have said that Steve Bannon is the president's connection to the base. In some ways he is, but he's also got Kellyanne Conway, who uh, very much is in touch with the president's base, as well as women in the Republican Party. And so the fact that Steve Bannon is, is leaving or will be a loss for the president, but he does have some other backup there in terms of maintaining that connection to the base and uh, certainly to Republican women, Sandra. I uh, just wanted to get this in here, reporting from Catherine Herridge, uh, saying in her intelligence context says he learned about 40 minutes ago about this news from a senior Republican Party source, saying concerns for Republican Party believes continued fallout out with General Kelly played a role in all of this. John? 
Yeah, and you know, General Kelly doesn't have the easiest job around uh, either. You know, he comes from a military background. He, he is well versed in politics in terms of him being the political liaison chief of staff for uh, the secretaries of defense, Leon Panetta, as well as uh, Robert Gates. Uh, but don't forget, you're dealing with Donald Trump here, and there's only so much you can do to try to keep uh, the president's uh, ship on course, to keep that train rolling down the tracks before you quickly become persona non grata in, in the president's eyes. And some people that I've been talking to uh, say that what the president did earlier this week in that bizarre press conference in Trump Tower was in a way to say to General Kelly, well, you may be trying to control me, but I'm the one who's going to control me. Let's not forget you're the chief of staff. You work for me. I am the boss. Uh, so General Kelly, I think, is, is he's, he's probably got a very tough challenge there. If he thought that going into Iraq in 2003 wow. was a challenge yeah. when he was with First Marines, he's got a